We now return to Let's Play Suzerain. Balance of Power in Eastern Mercopa. Any time, game. The Radical. Archaic State of Sorland's Conscription Laws. Dear reader, I ask you this. What year are we in? 1880s? 1920s? The matter I'm writing about is, of course, mandatory military service again. In times when there are no active wars, why do we still need to have these archaic conscription laws? Let me answer that. It is because someone profits from it. Not only does this make the warmongering solists happy, it also works out for large defense corporations. The oligarchs are now swimming in money while we still have to send our children away when they come of age. We are in the modern age. If we want to modernize Swordland and catch up to the superpowers, if we want to lose this militaristic identity so that we can intellectually prosper, mandatory conscription laws need to go. Geopolitico. Reign to meet with Smolak and Van Horten. Swordland is embarking on a great geopolitical gamble with the new trade initiative organized by the, military, or the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The hope is the solidification of relations with the old ally Agnolia and troublesome neighbor Whelan, with the aim of regaining some of the regional diplomatic influence the country used to have. Each of these countries have different agendas, which will create some difficulties for President Rain. Prime Minister Van Horten, will, who was elected through a powerful democratic movement, wants to reimagine trade with Swordland, while President Smolak of Whelan is looking for foreign investments and security cooperation against rebellious British movements at the border. Lesbia and Vogsland are watching Swordland's actions very closely and are sure to react to any sort of balance of power shift. Always got to look for stuff. Okay. Ministry of Health discusses privatization. The Ministry of Health has begun working on a health report with a proposal to allow privatization in the health system to potentially generate new resources for the ministry. Minister Benowal is personally overseeing the discussion and the report with top aides, including members of the National Business Council. Religious Harmony Bill. Sign or veto the Religious Harmony Bill that was approved by the Grand National Assembly. For the purposes of increasing religious harmony and unity, the following laws are established in religious affairs. Section 1 of the RHB will ensure that the Day of Dissension ceremony in the Arch Sanctuary of Dare shall from now on only hold sermons in the Sordish language. Section 2 will forbid sanctuaries from holding sermons in Bludish unless they receive approval from the Arch Priest... Priest... Arch... Priest of Swordland. Section 3 will enforce that all priests applying to be state sanctioned have Swordish descendants to be able to receive their salaries and pensions. Uh, I think we're going to veto that one. Turn 5. I veto the Religious Harmony Bill. President Rain protects religious freedoms. President Rain has recently vetoed the outrageous Religious Harmony Bill. The bill was aiming to limit the freedoms of British people in Swordland. The, the, the MP to propose this bill was, of course, Kassaro Kibner, the leader of the NFP himself. Mr. Kibner has never stopped his attacks on British people, and we are sure that he will continue his racist onslaught and his attempts to further divide the country. President Rain's decision to veto this, this discriminatory bill which was a clear attack on religious and personal freedoms, will be welcomed by bloods and swords alike. <sighs> Superpowers offer aid. United, Cantana, and Arcasia are offering aid in return for military access to installations. Excuse me. United, Cantana, and Arcasia have approached us with a substantial financial aid offer in return for refuel and repair access at our military installations. United, Cantana requests access for its ships to be able to dock at the Conriat Naval Base, while Arcasia requests access for its jets to land at the Erlery Air Force Base in return for the aid. Well, here again, one of the few chances we get to bump our budget back up. I 
I don't necessarily like the idea of allowing... I mean, this is very close to picking a side. And I don't like the idea of allowing them to have military presence within our country. On the other hand, perhaps the threat of that will help us against Rumberg. And I'm going to try and get Lesbia on my side, and doing that with Arcasia might be... might be helpful. I would like Vogsland also to be on my side, but like I said, I don't think I'm going to have this opportunity. And if I'm going to be trying to work with Agonland, I can't also work with Fogsland. There's an issue there. I do need some money. But I can see this going wrong very quickly. I mean, you know, on the one hand, this could help put pressure on Rumberg. On the other hand, it could also provoke Rumberg. Because they're like, look, I mean, because they've already denounced us as, as being a military threat to the region. If we start doing this, that might hurt even more. Do we want that just for some money? The thing is, how many more opportunities are we going to get to get money? The, the, this is turn five already, and there's only been once when budget has gone up. These might help in the coming negotiations. All right, let's take Arcasian aid and hope this helps with some leverage for Lesbia. And it'll also give me some money. And hopefully we'll put pressure on Rumberg and hopefully not provoke them into attacking me. This is very provocative, and not just Rumberg. Kantana and Vogsland might be an issue with this. Fuck. So I've already been second-guessing myself this entire game, but the failure to get my own party su to support a reform for the Constitution is hurting me even more. Like now I just don't know what to think. Let's take Arcasian aid. Military. Arcasia gives airbase access. The Swordish Air Force allows the Arcasian 4th Fighter Squadron to refuel and repair at the Air Force base. This is now a yellow issue. So I'm guessing that's not necessarily a good thing. Diplomacy. Neutrality. Uh... We're still neutral, but we are now getting Arcasian aid. Arcasia is sending sub substantial amounts of financial, logistical, and equipment aid to support us. Rain's weak international leadership. Another checkbox has been ticked on the growing list of Mr. Rain's weak leadership decisions. His decision, recent decision to accept the Arcasian financial aid makes Swordland look weak. It seems that our time of strong leadership in the international theater has long passed. Mr. Rain not only failed to keep his own country, Swordland, afloat, he now dares sell our long-lasting standing in the region in return for servitude to a major superpower like Arcasia. How else are we going to make the fucking budget? Yep, condemnation from United Cantana. 
The United Cantanan Ambassador in Holsord condemned the financial deal between Swordland and Arcasia, criticizing President Rain for inviting Arcasia to meddle in Eastern Merkopan affairs. He announced that Chairman Milenyev will do whatever it takes to defend its sphere from encroaching Arcasian imperialism. Well, I'm going to be honest. I mean, if we don't pass this constitution and it seems like it's not going to happen, um, I fucking don't care anymore. The game is over as far as I'm concerned. I don't care how long this game drags out. That was literally the whole point of why we were elected. A call from Gus Manger, Office of the President. I was sipping my first cup of coffee for the day when the phone lit up and rang. I swore under my breath. I thought my schedule was clear for at least half an hour. I picked up the phone. Uh, Mr. President, how are you doing on this fine day, if I may ask? <sighs> fine as well. You? I'm good, because business in Swordland is running as usual from my end. Thanks for asking. I'm calling you because I received a call from the CEO of Armandine Industries, Aaron Bridges, about the recent initial public offering on the Ventry City Stock Exchange. As you might have guessed, it's about your little venture, our little venture investment of a thousand shares worth of a million ren. Very pleased to say that we've made gains. The shares have doubled in price at the IPO, and we will soon receive profits made from the investment. Isn't that great? I mean... It, that is, I guess. It's the one good thing I've got going on right now. It's not necessarily going to help anything but me. Okay, sure. Great news, Gus. How much did we make? You'll love it. In total, we've made nearly two million Swordish Ren. I doubled. I bet that right now you're wishing you had bought more stocks earlier, right? I'm not much of a risk taker, says the guy who is now taking on his entire party with a massive reform bill. Well, uh, I mean, I wasn't really... I didn't have the money to give away for that. I don't know, is this going to imply that I'm going to keep it in there? Is there am I going to get a choice to take it out? I have been trying to do middle-of-the-road stuff right now. Ah, eh, whatever. I'm not much of a risk-taker. Oh, come on. You're the president. Nobody got to that seat without taking massive risks. I assure you, this will pale in comparison to what we'll do together in the future. The money will be transferred to your personal bank account shortly. Very well. Talk to you later, then. Goodbye for now. The line dropped. Well, we got some money back. That's good news, I guess. Economists. Armandine stocks jumped to nearly double. The CEO of Armandine, Aaron Bridges, announced the IPO this morning at the Ventry City Stock Exchange, with the opening value of the stocks doubling due to high demand by the market. Images of celebration were visible at the Ventry Times newspaper. A new era for portable radios has begun for the average citizen with major, major advances in military technology pushing civilian technology forward. Private party at the Gentleman's Club. Alright. Villa of Peter Venter. Far from becoming accustomed to my workload as president, I only felt more and more snowed under as the weeks passed. It had been ages since I had any time to myself. I was starting to lose my focus, and my temper was growing increasingly thin. Peter was the first to realize I needed a break. After much cajoling, he finally persuaded me to come to a meeting of his new venture, Gentleman's Club. For the past few months, he'd been hosting a salon of sorts, not just for politicians and businessmen, but also for artists, entertainers, people of hit taste, he told me, with a smile on his face. There was only one rule, no wives or girlfriends allowed, hence the name. And so I found myself in front of his new luxury villa in Erlery. Very loud jazz music emanated from inside. I waited and waited. Finally, Peter opened the door. I could smell the whiskey on his breath. Anton, finally, now the real party can start. Come on in. As soon as I entered, Peter closed the door and turned to the small crowd. Gentlemen, a minute of your time, please. I now have the privilege to present to you the man himself, the fourth president of Swordland, Mr. Anton Rain. 
I'd known him for long enough to understand that he was more than a little drunk. He made an elaborate mock curtsy as I passed him and walked into the room. The music stopped, and I felt everyone's eyes on me. Good evening. Peter nodded at me and turned to the attendees. Dear members, please give a warm welcome to our very special guest. If I may, Anton, here, take this. He handed me a glass of whiskey and put his hand on my shoulder. We all know why we're gathered here tonight. To celebrate life. To have a brief escape from our tumultuous professions. I personally don't know any better cure for stress than a little drink. Raise your glass. I raised my glass and the rest of the crowd followed. Now, the tradition dictates that as club president I have to remind you of our house rules. There are three. No politics, no wives, no one sober. Cheers. Peter drank the whiskey in his glass in one go. I'll just sip the whiskey. Anton Rain might have the power to make presidential decrees, but I, Peter Vector, and the president of this club now declare this party started. Music. Go. The band started up again. After greeting the crowd around me, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Let me show you around. We walked through the corridors of his mansion. Statues and paintings lined the stark white walls. An arched window provided a view of the neatly manicured grounds, complete with a swimming pool. A grand lesbian marble staircase led up to the st second story. Peter gestured at the massive crystal chandelier hanging overhead. That chandelier was made in the 18th century. Can you believe it? There's even a hedge maze in the garden. Um, how are you paying for all of this? I'll let you in on a secret. Gus Mang Manger has a lot of contacts in real estate. He brokered a good deal for me. He'll also be here tonight. I can introduce you if you like. Uh, we know Gus, thank you. Uh, what did you promise him in return, Peter? Only my money. We continued walking until we circled back to where we'd started. So, what do you think of my little hideaway? I mean, it, it sounds more like a palace, Peter. It's amazing, but I'd hardly call it a hideaway. It's more like a palace. It definitely doesn't rival yours. Anyway, let's get back to the party. I arranged for some caviar to be brought in from Lesbia. You're going to love it. He opened the door to the main hall, and we rejoined the other guests. The music was louder now, and the mood decidedly inebriated. This uh, concerns me for dear old Peter here. Is, uh, this sounds somewhat like insider trading, although, you know, with real estate. Given that we are uh, currently funding an anti-corruption police force, makes me wonder what's going to happen here. Cocktail waitresses were carrying around plates of canape, canapes, canapus, hors d'oeuvres, wearing dresses that left little to the imagination. I mean, didn't we have a, we had an issue with him and his wife, didn't we? And I promised to talk to him about it. He's drunk though, and I'm not sure this is necessarily the time. Um, I guess we could do this. I thought this was a gentleman's club. Would you rather get served by wrinkly old men? Sweetheart, over here. He waved at one of the waitresses, and she came over to us. She was in her mid-twenties, wearing red lipstick, her blonde hair neatly tied in a ponytail. On her plate were toast points slathered in the lesbian caviar Peter had mentioned. I took a bite. It was rich, salty, tasting of pure seaside. I could almost hear the sound of waves and seagulls. Lesbian caviar. Best in the world, I'm telling you, Anton. There are few pleasures in life that are this... As the waitress left us to serve another attendee, she flashed a quick smile at Peter over her shoulder. He smiled back, a little too broadly. Sensual. His eyes were still fixed on her, with an expression I remembered from our many nights out together as students. Oh, look, there's Gus. Why don't you go talk to him? I'll be back shortly. Uh, Peter, I'm warning you, don't make a mistake here. 
This is a, this could be very bad, Peter. Politically, this could this could not help us. Mistake? What are you talking about? I'm just going to the washroom. I'll be back before you know it. He left the room and I headed over to Gus. Gus Manger was standing next to a couple of men that I recognized as banking industry magnates. As I approached, all of them turned to me and bowed their heads. Mr. President, a toast to our new member, everyone. Gus and I clinked our glasses as the people around us raised theirs. You don't seem at all surprised to see me here. That's because Peter told me you were going to come. He also told me that you might be interested in potential opportunities such as, well, this. He opened his arms, gesturing at our opulent surroundings. Let's take a walk. The balcony has an amazing view of Erlery. We left the room and made our way to the balcony. On the way, we took out two cigars and held one out. He took out two cigars and held one out for me. I'll refuse the cigar. I turned the cigar down. Gus lit up his own and started smoking. We went out to the balcony. All of Erlery was at our feet. From this vantage point, I was able to see how expansive the building plot was. The swimming pool and the hedge maze were visible from here. Leaning over the railing, I admired the view for a moment before Gus spoke up. I know you're wondering about the deal Peter made. In a nutshell, thanks to my network, he was able to procure this house for half the asking price, which would have been impossible under any other circumstances. I'd be delighted to discuss a similar arrangement with you. In fact, I have prepared a document with my own personal favorite opportunities. This is the least I can do, since you have been generous to many business people in this country. My investment decisions, or the decisions I've made about the country? I don't think I want to spend any more of my money. I gambled and I got it back. It's time to walk away from the table. I don't think I'm looking to make any more investments at the moment. Real estate is the best investment anyone can make. With the current economic situation, it only makes sense to put your money into such a tangible asset. But I also have a few other opportunities for you to make a side profit, if real estate doesn't really interest you. Is there any chance I can convince you? I don't know. I mean, this smacks of corruption, and literally we're enforcing a, an anti-corruption police force. I mean, I guess we can just say this, because then he'll probably give me another chance to say no thanks, right? I doubt I would be locked into one choice of whatever available. All right. Tell me what you've at least got, so I know what you're doing. I knew you'd come around. Gus opened his briefcase and pulled out a thin dossier. He showed it to me. My first offer is, of course, real estate. There is a vineyard close to Erlery, about a one-hour drive from here, that also includes a very large villa. A beautiful plot, but rather neglected, so there would be a fair amount of renovation costs. On the bright side, you'd be able to produce our, our, your own wine. The previous owner was Geralt of Ribery, a well-known vintner. World-renowned vintner. Is Pioneer Swordish Viticulture Culturist and Winemaker Famous for the famous Boren Grape Interesting Don't know if I actually Had mentioned that before there's also the option of a football partnership. I already own a large portion of Anrica FC, and I'm doing my best to make them champions. Buying in would be more expensive than the vineyard, but this opportunity or this season will bring a lot of returns. I'm quite positive. Give me the word, and I'll start the procurement proceed process. Fuck me! But we must act quickly, as these options might soon disappear off the market. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think I want to do this now. Very well. Do not blame me if they're not available at a later date. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to refresh my drink. See you around. 
He left to rejoin the party. Alone on the balcony, I looked out over Erlery. Suddenly, I heard a rustling from the hedge maze below. I looked down and saw a silhouette. Two silhouettes, actually. So close together, they seemed to be entangled. I squinted and tried to get a better look. It was definitely two people kissing, but I couldn't see either of their faces. I returned to the party and spent some time mingling with the other guests, engaging them in small talk about their businesses, their children, their relationships. Around an hour later, Peter showed up next to me. See, I told you I'd be back before you knew it. Oh boy. Oh boy. I think we're going to have to have a talk with Peter here at some point. Is that you in the hedge maze? What are you talking about? I told you I went to the washroom. Peter's my best friend right now, my closest supporter. I don't want to push him away, but at the same time, the more reckless he becomes, the more of a danger he is politically. This at least has already let him know that I saw something, so maybe that's not. I mean, it's not enough for people like that. It's not enough. But this is not the time to deal with this, I guess. <sighs> Fuck. Maybe it is, though. Do we try and snip this in the bud before he does something that actually causes an issue? Do I risk pushing him away just for that? This game has me paranoid now. He's not going to listen to reason, though. He's, he's drunk right now, and he's in his own home. This is an opportunity for a scene to be made. All right, Peter, I think I'll just let this pass. I'm nothing, nothing just curious. All right, want a drink? Because I do. He poured us two large glasses of whiskey, and we drank them in one go. Throughout the party, we drank and drank, just like old times. I woke up the next day with a pounding headache and more than a few regrets. My memories of the evening were hazy, but there was one important detail that kept coming back to me. The red lipstick on Peter's collar. But maybe my memory was playing tricks on me. That's not good. Swordland today. Peter Vectorn throws lavish party. Vice President Peter Vectorn threw a lavish party at his new 1.5 million Ren three-story Erlery mansion, which was attended by high-profile businessmen and politicians, including President Rain and the Minister of Rural Development, Gus Manger, according to our sources from the Old Capitol. According to the reports, guests arrived in elegant suits and dresses for the swanky affair in the evening, but the Vice President and the President was nowhere to be seen at the entrance of the huge mansion. Nonetheless, it is worrying that Rain and Vectorn are throwing parties and having hidden meetings during the economic recession with so much trouble surrounding our nation. I didn't actually get the opportunity to not go to this. From the prism of leadership, the president and his administration have been an absolute failure. Extravagance and secrecy never ever stops with this president. Apparently the game doesn't think I'm doing very well. All right, one more. Briefing on the status of immigration regulation. We were in the middle of a meeting in the palace about our immigration policy. The ensuing discussion quickly became heated. I don't think so, Mr. Vichy. It just doesn't make any sense to me that a foreign citizen should come before a swordish citizen in Swordland. Well said. My analysis is also in line with this, especially during the economic recession. We are giving swordish jobs to migrants from other countries. What about our own people? Immigrants are the reason our economy is not completely unsalvageable. Look at Agnolian immigrants in Agenland. They, are re revital they have revitalized the whole region and in turn boosted the economy of the entire country. Simon can attest to that. Uh, statistically speaking, allowing immigrants to become part of the workforce contributes to our economy, but I agree the current situation is very nuanced. With that said, we can't just tighten our immigration policy and expect the economy to stay the same. We need to put our economy and the recession at the forefront. Thankfully, we've just started receiving financial aid from Arcasia. 
And then what? We'll become their servants? First they will place their war planes in Erlery. Then their armies will come. You will see. I do not approve of this decision at all. I mean, you people are bitching and moaning about the, the, the economy right now. And then you complain about the one thing that is actually added to our budget. I've done this for sordish citizens, nothing else. That's how they take over countries, you know. Mr. Lancia has a point. We have been in... T we, we have seen it happen many times. Gentlemen, can we please get back on topic? Right, sorry, Mr. Vichy. As I was just saying before I was interrupted, look at the superpowers. Do they? Do you see them closing off their borders? Why do you think their economies are in such good shape? They're in their current state because they welcome immigration and use it to their advantage. I mean, right now, the economy is a big deal, and I could bring this as justification. Because if I say, well, we need to modernize and reach the level of the superpowers, that's up for debate. Everyone can do that. But this is like, well, look, this makes economic sense, and we have at least some backing for that. I agree that we need to consider the economic impact of immigration. Our money flow should be at our utmost concern if we want to have the capability to accomplish actual change. We need a decision, but before we move on, Mr. President, do you have any question about the current state of immigration? I, do I get to ask all of these? Well, how many migrants or immigrants live in Swordland? Official numbers show that we have anywhere between 2 and 3 million immigrants residing in Swordland. That is the population of some of our provinces. Like, <laughs> even excluding the countless undocumented aliens in our midst, that is a very substantial amount. The primary issue is the strife they cause between less fortunate Swordish citizens and themselves. Yeah, the fortunate whatever thing, though, that's, that's not tied to them. That is tied to economic policies and industry. Including them in the workforce would benefit everybody, including unemployed swords. More taxes means more service, exactly. And like like I said, two to three million you're talking about if we if we if we got rid of them, and I don't think that's what's being proposed, I, but like that's literally the population of some of these fucking places. Like <laughs> that that is substantial. If not a province then at least some of the the cities. I'll have to look at that again, but it seems like when I've been clicking on some of these, well, I mean, we, we can actually look, can't we? Um, regions. Agonland. Four million res residents in Agonland. That is almost that is almost fifth largest. Uh, what was it? Lauren? Lauren was the smallest? Second smallest. Three million. That is the entire population of Lauren. Uh, Gruny? Fourth largest with four million. Yeah, literally the population of an entire region. How do they usually arrive here? There are three major paths they choose. The first one is the Agenland to Agnolia border. The second is the Bergia to Wayland border. And the third is the Loren coast. Agnolians are the largest group. It's a light border over there. Although recently, political fugitives from Vogsland have been crossing the Grey Sea to boat, by boat to land on our coast. Politically persecuted Wezek refugees tend to use the dangerous mountain passes at the Whalen border. Many of them also have British blood. What's the current legal status of our immigrants? Currently, all accepted immigrants are given a work permit on arrival so that they can work and contribute to the economy of Swordland. There is no current, currently no limit on the number of immigrants accepted. However, the number has remained stable over the past years. Despite the laws, the fact is many immigrants illegally work for corporations. That is the main issue with the immigration right now, not the immigration itself. 
Nonsense. If not for the unlimited amount of immigration, we wouldn't be in this state. Uh, let's move on and see what we can what can be done about the situation. Didn't I make a campaign promise about open borders? Very well. David Wishi opened his dossier stamped with the seal of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Before we make any decisions, I have to remind you. During the elections, we promised to keep our immigration laws relaxed, which I think is the right course of action. I disagree. We're supposed to control and reduce the negative effects of immigration, like crime and subversion. Okay, but if we're going to be talking about that, then we need to have our uh, law minister come in and talk about statistics, and not just maybes and what-ifs. I, I want concrete evidence of things we say here. I see your point, Yosef, but the economy certainly benefits from more immigration. And that is so far the only evidence that has been presented at this meeting. Internal order, on the other hand, suffers immensely. I would th this would disagree. I mean, this is not necessarily tied. This, I guess. We've not decided how to handle it, leaving loopholes in the system that tend to be exploited. We should tighten the laws to prevent further chaos. David sighs wearily. This is going nowhere. If we decide to tighten immigration, what does that entail? We would have to impose quotas and connect it to that stricter border control, on top of allowing our economy to take a hit. Okay, we can't do that. Mr. Hull, surely the well-being of our citizens and our internal security will more than compensate for any downturn in the markets. Agreed. Sordish citizens should take priority. What are the consequences of keeping our policy relaxed? Aside from keeping us on the path to prosperity, modernity, and continuous improvement, not much. Our current system is good for our era. We also have the capacity. This will allow us to continue protecting investments from foreign countries, which in turn will keep our trade steady. We would be more trustworthy partners. Stability draws money. Stability? What stability? We're already seeing clashes between our people and foreign interlopers. On the, I mean, are we? Because this is like an internal political conflict going on here. On the contrary, the only way we can achieve stability is through tightening our immigration policy. You heard the lady. Swordland first. Okay, well, what we've been told so far is things are getting better on the stability issue, so... Yes? Everyone leaned forward, eager to hear my response. <sighs> We're going to keep the laws relaxed. That's what I ran on, and we need to keep to it. I'm glad you made the right choice. We will be forced to handle new waves of migrants from Magnolia. That's apparently not the place that's the problem, is it? Our border posts aren't ready. Uh, we're going to be talking to Magnolia anyway. Persia, if anywhere, is where the problem is with uh, the, the bloods. But that's sort of a, a nationalist issue that's starting that. Not only that, we've just abandoned the native swords who need our support the most. Also, this will bring a new tide of refugees from Wayland. Bergia is already a difficult region to manage. This is shameful. I mean, this is true. Going into logic is a fuzzy thing, because they have their own logical decisions and, and choices on why they think they, the way they do. The citizens of Swordland are not forgotten. Our work for them continues. And now they will compete with foreign immigrants just to put food on their tables. I'm disappointed in you, Rain. Well, that's... I mean, you were before I even became president, so... Anything else, Mr. President? Let's end this discussion and get to work. There are changes to be made. The ministers gathered their documents and rose from their chairs, some with frowns on their faces. I'm looking forward to the upcoming trade talks. Peter and I have been visiting Stallport and Rock Rocklovitz in preparation. I'll be coming along to talk with the economy minister. Looking forward to the potential partnership. If we're finished, I need to head off and get the ministry to work on the new policy. Same here. Our border units need to be informed and prepared. 
Keep up the good work. The minister is dispersed. Fuck. Streamlined immigration. The latest immigration policy closed loopholes, reduced illegal immigrants, and streamlined legal migration processes. It is still yellow, however. But that's better than red. Nationwide, nationwide protests quelled. The nationwide protests have been quelled thanks to our devoted efforts. Well, there you go. At least something came out of this, huh? Diplomacy. Relaxed immigration. Relaxed immigration laws streamline and shorten the immigration process incentivizing immigrants. Still have a lag of allies. Hopefully that's coming. All right. Well, here we go. We just keep digging a hole. I guess go big or go home, huh? Anyway, I'll see you next time.